thank you also for the opportunity to speak. This um, is a great conference. It wasn't around, the stuff like this wasn't around when I was a graduate student and I would have appreciated it a lot. I think we should um, maybe thank this, the, the organizers again for putting in all the extra work. <laughs> all right. um, so um, I have, my talk is kind of split into two halves. And so let me explain what the two halves are. All right, so um, this, so quantum topology kind of started in the late 80s, and it's very much related. I mean, basically, it grew out of the Jones polynomial for knots and links. If you, um, so, so in the um, 80s or so, there's the Jones polynomial for um, links in S3, right? And so this was Jones, and shortly thereafter, um, Witten, who is a mathematical physicist, said, hey, we can do this um, by using Kirby moves. Um, we can kind of soup this up and get a quantum invariant, some kind of an analog for three-dimensional manifolds. So then there's, um, but being a physicist, this wasn't all completely legit, so it was made legit by two uh, mathematicians, Rashitikin <laughs> Turayev, and they used uh, representations of quantum groups. Um, so this is a quantum invariant for three manifolds. And associated to this um, is also there's an associated T um, topological quantum field theory. Um, for the Jones polynomial, there's a two variable version called the Homfley polynomial. There's a lot of stuff here um, that are kind of in the same realm. Um, but one of the big questions in this area is, okay, great, we have these great new invariants, what does it mean, right? And so that's still a very um, wide open question, not very much is known. And um, growing out of these two, um, these invariants is this thing that I wanna talk about today. And it's called the Kaufman bracket skein algebra of a surface. Um, and as I'll explain in a, in a while, the definition comes straight out of that, that whole construction. What I find interesting about this Kaufman bracket skein algebra is that it was also, it was, it's um, related to hyperbolic geometry in the sense of Thurston, so geometric topology. So it's related to um, hyperbolic geometry. And in particular, um, there's a thing, this object inside the um, um, inside hyperbolic geometry called the SL2C character variety of the fundamental group and of a surface S. Okay. So my plan today is to do the following. I want to kind of, well, start here to find this, but through kind of the lens of this combinatorial description, I'll come here and talk about why it's related to hyperbolic geometry. And the last thing, if I have time, is to kind of do a survey of um, uh, results or some open directions questions or things that you know, can be done, okay? All right, that mostly they relate to the Kaufman bracket scan algebra. All right, so, now, um, so let's start off with the definition. I'm gonna define the Jones polynomial, not quite the Jones polynomial, but the Kaufman bracket, which is essentially the same as the Jones polynomial. So here's the definition. Okay, so suppose I have a framed link. Um, for those of you, um, so framed link is essentially the same as a link, except it's slightly thick. So there's a choice of normal vector at every point on this link. So one way of thinking about this is that I'm thinking about this as a piecewise linear embedding of annuli or ribbons. Okay, so the, you take a ribbon, and you can tie it up in knots and glue it back together. It has to remain oriented. Um, the other thing I'll need for this definition is a variable, A. 
And the Kaufman bracket is computed using rules. And I'm going to write down the rules, and then I'll explain how to use the rules. So, um, so the first one is if you see um, in your framed link a thing that looks like this. Okay, so um, this isn't quite a framed link because a framed link is slightly thick, right? And so my, um, my convention is that what I'm going to draw is the S1. The 0, 1 part is coming straight out at you. Okay, so this is called either a vertical framing or a blackboard fr framing. So you should think of these as ribbons that come out straight at you like this. Okay, so if you see in your link a picture that looks like this, you're allowed, so there's two resolutions. And I'm going to take the sum of them. So there's the resolution that, so <laughs> as you're entering the crossing from the under crossing, if you make a right turn, so like this, then... Um, there's one, and then there's another one where you make a left turn. Okay. And furthermore, I want to keep track of whether it's left or right. So I'm going to replace, I'm going to stick in a, a coefficient in front if it's a, a, a right turn, and then a left turn which has a power of negative one. And the second one is that if I see a um, contractible trivial framed link, right? So remember the framing comes out straight at you like this. You can kind of just delete it. But in order to keep track that I deleted it, I stick in minus a squared minus a to the minus 2 in front. Okay, so let's do an example. I don't know. Here. Oh, here. So... As you can see, these calculations can be pretty, um, are going to be pretty involved once you have a lot of crossings, but I'll do one with just one crossing. All right, so I have, here's a framed link, right? The, uh, the vertical part, the, the framing is coming straight out at you. I have a crossing, I can replace it. There's a right turn and a left turn. And so now let's see, if I do a right turn, here's the right turn and here's the left turn. Now, in this picture, I have um, one circle, so a times minus a squared minus a to the minus 2, a inverse, and now this one I have 2. And so the answer to this one is I'm going to get a to the minus a squared. Okay, so I have a copy of that in both of them, and then I have, this one just has a, that one has <laughs> minus a minus a to the minus 3, I believe. If I, let me know if I'm making a mistake. So my answer, my volume, my Kaufman bracket is um, minus a squared minus a to the minus 2 times minus a to the minus 3. Okay, so here's a, here's a theorem due to um, Kaufman. Um, the Kaufman bracket is an invariant of framed links. So let's see. Let me do another example because sometimes it's helpful just to see another, ex a few more examples. Here's another example. Suppose I do it the other way. Okay. So then what happens? So let's see. Again, I have right turn plus left turn. So in this case, when I go in for my towards on, on my undercrossing, if I make a right turn. I get this picture, and if I get the left turn, I get the other picture, right? And you can see that if I switch, because I switch the crossings, basically the only difference is A and A inverse are swapped at every stage. And so actually what happens is that this one you get, um, uh, let's see, minus A, let's see. So all the A's and A's, so, so A squared minus A to the minus 2 times minus A to the plus 3 in this case, okay? And then, okay, so, so here's one more example, just to make this really, really um, obvious. So there's this one. So that one's minus a squared minus a to the minus 2, and then I deleted it. There's nothing left, right? So for example, so this means that um, by the theorem, what this says is that this, um, this 
and this, that these three framed links are all distinct as framed links. Okay? All right. I'm going to keep this up. Uh, uh, I can't pull these up too high. Uh, all right, there we go. Um, let's see. Ah, right. So here, Kaufman has an invariant of framed links. To get the Jones polynomial, you want the Jones polynomial is for unframed links. And so there's some extra thing that I need to worry about. In, in particular, I need to count the number of Reitermeister moves that I make, right? And so there's some um, normalization that I can, something that I, that I can do to fix it, to make it in a, for unframed links. And by the fix, I have to make it oriented. And once I do all that and change my variable a little bit, I'll get the Jones polynomials. But basically, um, to me, this is the Jones polynomial. Okay. All right. So here's some remarks. Um, we almost proved this, but we didn't. Um, if in your picture, you see something that looks like this. This is uh, minus a to the minus 3. And I may have, I think that looks right. OK. And so this is what I mean about um, making sure, being careful about the Breitermeister 1 moves. So, all right, so the second thing is that if I have two links and I take their um, far away union, far union, right? So I have one here, another there, right? I can um, simplify my picture on this side, right? While keeping this one the same, right? And then, so then, so then what happens? I get the coffin bracket of this thing all on its own times the picture for this one with, every, with none of the resolutions, right? And then I can, so I have this polynomial and then I do it on this guy and I get this polynomial. Right, so then what I wanted to say is that this, if I two, take two links and then put them side by side, this is exactly just the polynomial, the bracket of K times the bracket of L. Okay. All right. Um, and the third thing is that this whole construction, I can generalize to any three manifold. I don't have to do M. I mean S3. I can do it any three manifold I want. Right. So. Um, I can generalize, um, so bracket for any framed link in a, a oriented. And the issue, the key here is that I need to use the orientation of a three manifold. Okay. All right. So um, one of the questions is once I generalize to the three manifold. So basically, I change S three up there to M, and that's it. Right? I can ask, OK, so if I have all the, th all the possible three manifolds, I want to understand what all the Kaufman brackets look like. OK, so one of the questions that I might want to ask is, is the algebraic structure of the brackets for an arbitrary three manifold? So here's what I'm going to do. And the motivation for this is um, kind of to, the idea is to um, find some kind of algebraic topology that corresponds to this. OK, so a lot of the constructions you will see, it's kind of like looking at homology, where um, you want to understand the structure of all possible, right, whatever it is, what kind of, whatever you're looking at, the homology of. OK, so here. All right, so here's a definition. Suppose M3 is oriented, three manifold. Um, I'm going to do something that is vaguely reminiscent of um, homology. I'm going to take all possible framed links. OK, and I'm going to take linear combinations of them. And then I'm going to, well, here, here's, maybe I should do it this way. I take all the possible framed links in M, whack it with the Kaufman bracket. Right? And then because that might not have structure, I'm going to take the, linear, the, the, um, 
the vector space generated by those. Okay, does that make sense? So I'm going to phrase it in a slightly different way. So this is going to be, that'll give me Kaufman bracket scan out scan module. Okay. So formally, it consists of linear combinations of um, framed links. Actually, I should say isotopy classes of framed links. Um, and remember, everything has A's and stuff in front of it. And so these are linear combinations with coefficients with A's and A inverses in front. So they will have um, Z adjoin A, A inverse. So these are just coefficients with A's and A's and A inverses. Um, quotiented by the skein relations one and two, and those are the ones up there, one and two up there. Okay, so let me just give some examples of how this works. So for example, um, say my manifold is S3. Okay, so now let's think, okay, I have framed link in S3. What thing will I get at the end? I do the skein relations, I res resolve the crossings one at a time, and then I'll get a bunch of circles, right? And then all the bunches of circles will all be minus a squared minus a to the minus two to some power. And so at the end of it, I'm gonna get just some polynomial in a and a inverse, right? And so this, and then, okay, so I take linear combinations of those and I still get a polynomial in a and a and inverse. So I get polynomials of a and a inverse, okay? Here's another example. Pardon? Um, yes, because of the way I, cons I, I, I told, I said I'm going to take linear, <laughs> and these are going to be my coefficients, yeah. All right, so um, let's see. Here's something. Let's take a solid torus. And here it's much, I, I, I like drawing pictures, so let's think about what something in here would look like. All right, so suppose I take a solid torus. This is solid. And so I take something inside, I don't know, I could take um, here something that lives inside of it, okay? And, or I can even make it have crossings. This is, oh, actually, you know what? I do want a crossing, okay. Um, all right, that looks good, okay. So I have a little kink here, right? I have number one over there, I can get rid of the kink. And actually, when I get rid of the kink, notice that maybe I should do this. I'll do it slowly. Okay, let me get rid of the kink first. So I have right turn. And then I have a left turn. This little one bounds a disk, I can get rid of it. Right, so then, um, if I do this correctly, I believe I should get minus a uh, plus three. And once I get rid of it, I'm going to have two copies of those, right? So I think if you do the calculation, you'll see this. And now I'm going to simplify this. Now I'm going to get rid of this crossing. So I get minus a cubed. Um, OK, so this is parentheses. Ah. Okay. This is what happens when I do calculations in public. Um, all right, let's try it again. OK, so I need more space. OK, um, a minus a cubed times, and then there's two resolutions. Resolution one, resolution two. One has an A in front, one has an A inverse in front. And then here I can make a right hand turn or I make a left hand turn and I go through like this. Okay. And I am really running out of room. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't think we need So now I get 
um, minus a cubed times a times, right, goes around this way, plus minus a cubed times a to the inverse. And then notice that red circle over there bounds a disk, right? So I get minus a squared minus a to the minus 2 times something with nothing inside. And I think that's basically all that I can do, right? So these circles, although they don't have crossings in the solid torus, they don't bound a disk, so I can't get rid of them, okay? And so this is an example of something that is an element or a skein inside my skein module. They're linear combinations of pictures, okay? Now, um, let me denote this one by x2, and the exponent is up there for a reason, and this one x0. Okay, so here's um, a fact, is that um, SA of the solid torus is spanned by x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, so it's an infinite dimensional um, vector space, although technically it's, I should say module. Okay. All right, so um, here's a proposition. Pardon? What if the knot is the other homology generator? Um, which other one? Ah, it's a solid torus. Oh, it's, a it's solid, solid right? Yeah. I'm gonna do the non I'm gonna do the hollow torus in just a second, so hold on. Okay, so how much time do I have? Ah, am I 25 minutes in already? Yes? Okay, all right, I'm almost there. All right, so um so maybe I shouldn't write this down. Um, for manifolds, um, the skein module is computed for few. So in fact, there's a list of them. So um, it turns out, wait, okay. So it turns out that if you take connect sums of two manifolds, that it, you get the tensor product. And so you really only need to compute these for the prime manifolds. For the prime manifolds, it's known for um, S1 cross S2, for the lens spaces, surfaces cross S1, quaternionic, prism manifolds, um, thickened uh, eye bundles over surfaces, and some, like, basically torus, co um, compl not complements of two bridge links and torus knots, and that's it. Okay, so there's a lot of other manifolds out there for which this is not known what the, out the module structure is. Okay, so that's kind of like an interesting um, tidbit. Um, all right, so um, I'm gonna focus on um, a particular class of examples of these three manifolds for which there is additional algebraic structure and where there's known, like there's more that is known, okay? So let's see. Um, so let's say special example. So this is a special class of example where M is a thickened surface, okay? Where Sigma is a um, oriented surface. So the way I like to think about it, this is essentially just a surface with a little bit of room so that you can have over and under crossings. Okay. Um, so in particular, what is known, it's here's, um, it's known that the skein module is spanned. Well, actually, we know that it has a basis. Um, multi curves on a slice. So a multi curve basically is a disjoint union of simple closed curves, right? None of it with no crossings um, and no contractible loops. So um, no contractible loops. Oops. No crossings. Okay, and the other thing, more interesting thing, is there's an algebra, algebra multiplication on sigma cross, on the skein algebra of the thickened surface by what I call stacking. Okay, and so now, what's in, so what's interesting is now, not only do I have a module, I'm gonna have an algebra. So let me give an example of what I mean by what this is. So, so let's take 
example. A of a torus cross zero one. Okay, and again, I'm going to convince you of this by pictures. So suppose I have um, a torus, right? And this one, this time, it's going to be hollow and slightly thick, right? So for example, I can have um, this curve on there, and or I can have the other. Um, as noted, other homology generator, right? And so what I can do is I can put one on top of the other, right? So for example, I'm going to multiply these, and I get this on top of this, okay? So um, there's exactly one crossing in the inside the inside the torus part. Okay, so for example, I can then, in the skein module, this is also the same as A times one of the resolutions plus A inverse times the other resolution. Right, so I should use a different color. Um, right hand turn, left hand turn. Everyone okay with me? Um, on the other hand, um, if I multiply the other way, I'm going to put one on top of the other. I get, okay, so this one I do yellow on top and red on bottom. Okay. And I wait, when I decompose them, it'll look like exactly the same picture, but with A and A inverse swapped. Okay. And so in particular, um, what I know is that this is not the same. Okay, so what I get is that this is a Non-commutative algebra. Okay. Um, as a module, it's um, spanned. It has basis. Okay, so the basis consists of all the multi curves on a on a single slice along one one. Um, on the torus without crossings and without contractible loops. These are exactly just the um, MN torus links, right? So these are the torus links um, of torus links. Okay. As, a gen as an algebra, so if I allow this multiplication, then I don't need as many generators. And it turns out that I don't need all infinitely many of them um, generated by one zero, zero, one, so this one, that one, and one of these two. Okay, you don't need the other one because of the, the, the multiplication that I have right there. All right, so um, what do I need to say next? Ah, maybe, okay, so ah, maybe here I can say that here. Remark. It's possible for two surfaces to be not the same, but their thickenings to be the same. Right, so for um, the classic example is a one punctured um, torus, right? You can deform that and make that flat, right? So, um, so, so what can happen is that, and sigma prime, because the manifolds themselves are homeomorphic, these skein, skein modules are isomorphic modules. But um, because of the homeomorphism between them, the product structure is no longer the same, right? So when you kind of make this homeomorphic to that, you lose the product structure. And so um, and not as algebras. Yeah, quick question. question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I want, I want parallel copies. I'm going to allow. I need to allow parallel copies. So they're going to be not torus knots, but torus links. Okay. Right. Right. In the sense that I had to have two. Okay. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Right. So you can think of them as um, powers of the torus knots. Okay. So you have like an X and Y, and like final nails. Yes. That's right. That's right. 
So, um, for example, like I want to allow like um, that's in my that's in my basis. Okay. Yeah. No problem. All right. So, um, so because of all of this. Um, it really, um, this algebra structure is very dependent on the product structure that I kind of started off with. And so because of that, um, I'll write SA of sigma instead um, when I'm thinking of it as an algebra. Okay, instead of SA of sigma cross zero one, just to make that um, clear. Okay, so now, all right. I think that's it for the first half. That's the definition, right? Here's the Kaufman brackets gain algebra. I'm gonna now turn to hyperbolic geometry. And um, so this second part will feel quite different. And the game for you is to figure out at what point um, you see this skein theory come through, okay? Because it's not gonna be obvious and um, so keep an eye out for the skein relation. All right, so here's some hyperbolic geometry. Here's sigma oriented. I want it to be finite topological type. If you want, it's a closed surface, closed surface with punctures, closed surface with a few boundary. Okay, so um, the Teichmuller space is the set of complete hyperbolic finite area metrics on sigma up to isotopy. Right, so, so I think um, on yesterday, Catherine Mann said a few things about this. So there's a picture down here where you have a surface, right? Hyperbolic surface. And you can look at its universal cover. If, so here's sigma. Here's sigma tilde. If you have a complete hyperbolic metric, what happens is that this is another way of saying it, is that the universal cover is the hyperbolic plane. Um, you can um, look at a fundamental domain. And a fundamental domain here is, remember, the geodesics are um, perpendicular. So you get, um, you can get, wait, how many do I have? I need one more. <laughs> All right, so you can get this out of gluing an octagon, like a hyperbolic octagon up, upstairs inside the hyperbolic plane. You can glue them up in pairs, and you can get um, this thing down here, okay? So, um, and what do I mean about the different metrics? The different metrics on sigma correspond to the different shapes of octagons that you have upstairs, All right? So you've had, if you're gluing it out of like a, a completely regular octagon, you're gonna get a different metric downstairs than if you're gonna take a like not very regular uh, octagon that I have here. So um, the fundamental domain is a hyperbolic polygon. The shape of polygon tells you exactly what the metric is on sigma downstairs. Remember, think sigma now is completely thin, right? There's no thickening. It's, it's thin. Um, not only that, but this polygon tiles the hyperbolic plane. Right, so I think yesterday she had some picture that looked like that, right? And um, you can go from one fundamental domain to another one, from one tile to the other by, um, let's see, say this one is identified with that one, then um, you can, there's some depth transformation, right, that takes this one to the, to the next, to, to takes this edge to that edge, right? And, not only, and because everything is hyperbolic, that deck transformation acts as an isometry, right? So, um, so tiles H2 with the symmetries um, equal to the deck transformations um, uh, by pi one of S. Um, and these are also isometries of H2. So, in other words, what I'm going to do is exactly what Catherine did then. I'm going to convert this into some algebra language using homomorphisms of the fundamental group. Okay, so 
And here's a proposition. So this Tyke Miller space, you can instead think of them as monodromy maps, deck transformations. I one of, did I use S or sigma? Ah, sigma. Okay. And every element of your fundamental group corresponds to an isometry of H2 up to conjugation. Everyone okay? All right. What are the isometries of H2? Um, if I think of this H2 as um, the set of complex numbers with modulus less than 1, then these are exactly the uh, Mobius transformations. These are another way of thinking about them. They send z to az plus b over cz plus d, where ad minus bc is 1. And um, they're all real numbers. Okay. Um, instead of writing them this way, you can also denote them as matrices, right? A, B, C, D, real valued matrices, right? So M, M 2 by 2 of R, such that A, D minus B, C is equal to 1. Except there's one problem. Can you guys see the problem? There's, when I go convert from this map to this, this is a fraction. So I can divide by, like I have minus signs everywhere. So except that um, uh, A, B, C, D should be the same as minus A, minus B, minus C, minus D. Because if I took the fraction, they'd be exactly the same. OK, so this thing here is called PSL2R. OK, all right. Um, so great. I've converted hyper all, all possible metrics on my surface into some kind of algebra thing, OK? Now, the problem is this is algebraic, but not enough, OK? So in particular, there's for certain things I don't like. I don't like that there's this P here where I have to like get rid of these two guys. I also don't like R because R isn't very algebraic. Nope. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some space that's slightly bigger. I know that algebraists always look at me funny when I say things like that. Um, but it's true, right? Um, you want to make your problem as nice as possible. So instead of looking at Teichmuller space, I'm going to look at a space that is slightly bigger. OK, so if this thing is, I'm going to denote it by R sigma. And again, I'm going to look at pi 1 of sigma. Instead of SL2R, I'm going to do SL2C. So these are the two by two matrices, coefficients in um, entries in complex numbers with determinant one. Okay. And I'm going to mod out by conjugation. And because I'm doing algebra, I'm going to take a double one. So um, so what this is is a um, gym in the in, is a quotient in terms of geometric um, invariant theory. Um, let me tell you what that is. So essentially what this means is that if I have two maps in here. They're equivalent if and only if the traces are equivalent. Okay. So two maps are the same if the traces are the same. And so and, uh, when you take traces of maps, sometimes people call these characters. And so this thing is the thing, this is the um, SL2C character. So the, the points in this character variety are actually traces of monodromies, right? Traces of hyperbolic uh, metrics, if you want to think about it that way. OK, so um, this is an algebraic variety. Um, and not only that, um, if you look at the regular functions on this algebraic variety, it's a symplectic manifold with the Poisson bracket. So there's a lot of really nice algebra going on with that. And this Poisson bracket, um, there's an explicit, um, explicit um, formula. Do do Goldman. Um, do do. All right. So what I want to do is understand a little bit about these regular functions.
Um, sigma could be closed. It could be have punctures. It could have, um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So I'm going to define some of these maps. Okay. So here's a definition. K is a loop in sigma. So in your head, you should think of it. I don't know. Yeah, there's a loop. Okay. My surface isn't thick, so I might have crossings. All right, so suppose, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to define this function um, that goes from R of sigma to C. So this is kind of like an evaluation map at K. So what I do is if I have a homomorphism in, in here from pi 1 to um, SL2C, I can then take its trace. Right, so I can evaluate it at k and then take its trace. Right, and then I get a complex number at the end. Yeah, question. The trace of a function. Uh, oh, so suppose I have a gamma here. I get a matrix here. Right, and so I compose. I take the trace of this guy. It's it's a composition. I, I t trace composed with R, really, maybe I should say this. Trace composed with R. Yeah. Any other questions? Good question. Anything else? All right. So here, um, I can do that. All right. And so here, I can from here. And for technical purposes, I'm going to put a minus sign right there. OK. Um, this is. Uh, Trace map, you can think of it as an evaluation. Here's a theorem. Um, due to Helling in the 70s. So this has um, been around for a long time. Um, if you take all these trace functions, so they all, these trace functions, TK, they live in the space of regular functions, right? So they. The things in here are exactly the things that spit out complex numbers for the functions that from the character variety to C, right? So they definitely live in there. So um, the first thing is that the T um, trace maps functions generate okay. and not only do they generate, there's relations. Let me tell you where the relations come from. So the relations, um, so in SL2C, um, there's this thing called the trace identity, which says that if you take the trace of M times the trace of N, this is exactly the trace of mn plus the trace of mn inverse. Okay, So instead of having these matrices m and n, I can put r of k's in there. Okay, So, um, so in particular, I could say um, trace of r of k1, trace of r of k2 is equal to the trace of r of k1, r of k2. But because it's a homomorphism, I can do that. Right, so R of K1, K2, plus the trace of um, R of K1, K2 inverse. Everyone okay with me so far? Making sense? All right, so um, I had that minus sign in here, so I'm going to um, stick my minus signs in. So here I'm going to, this I'll convert as T, K1, minus T of K2 is equal to minus t of k1, k2, minus t of k1, k2 inverse. OK? All right. Here goes. I'm going to give the cat, let the cat out of the bag. That turns out to be, in pictures, the stain relation. OK, so let me try, show you why it's a, how it works. So imagine this is k1, um, is one of these crackles. Uh, let me. I need two colors. 
All right, so here's K1, here's K2, right? And you can imagine that here's, um, that it's connected up this way and it's connected up this way, like that. So here I have K1 times K2 um, is equal to minus, okay, so now if I orient this, one of the K1, K2s, K, so now I have, actually, you know what? I don't have multiplication, so I'm, remember I don't, I, my, my surface isn't thick, right? And so it actually is a crossing on the surface, right? I put, here's K1, here's K2, there's one crossing there, okay? And so now in the fundamental group, if I orient these, K1, K2 will be one of the resolutions, right? So I'll get, um, I don't know what to do, all right. I'll get one of these resolutions, and then let's see, one, this is K1, K2, and then I have the other resolution, right? But the key is that if you just focus on this part here, that's exactly the stain relation, okay? And the minus sign is there to make the algebra work. So here I have these two connected up together, but it could have been that these two were connected and these two were connected, and so to make all the, the other equation work is why I need that minus sign, okay? so. This is, um, this is the stain relation. Isn't that kind of, it's, it's a little bit surprising, right? It's the stain relation with A equals minus one, right? And if you think about this, this kind of makes sense, right? Because in stain relation, um, if I had thickening, right, it were thick, then when A equals minus one, this is minus one resolution. A inverse is also minus one. Right, but then if I did um, the other crossing, right, if I switch the crossing, I get also the same answer, right? So when A equals minus one, over and under crossings don't mean anything, and so it's not any different than if I were on the flat surface, right, and I had a crossing, okay? So basically what we've done is we've proved, here's the theorem. Here's a theorem, um, and this is due to a long list of people who notice this fact. Um, Bullock, um, Froman, Kanya, Bartosinskaya, Sinska, also Pushitsky, I think, Sikara, I think that's how you spell it. Um, there's also, um, Barrett, um, Turayev, Helling, lots of people, right? I mean, it's old math, right? That's the, so, okay, so for A equals plus or minus one, there's an isomorphism. So if you plug in A equals plus or minus one, there's an isomorphism um, with the algebra of regular functions which are generated by these trace functions, okay? And in particular, when A equals minus one, it's exactly as we think. So a skein here corresponds exactly to the trace, the trace function at K um, that goes, takes the SL2C character variety and spits out a number. It's exactly that map, okay? All right, so, um, these, this is a commutative algebra, right? This is a commutative algebra. I mean, they're isomorphic al algebras, right? So the question then next becomes, okay, if I make A not be minus one or one, can I, how can I think about that? And so is when A equals not off of, um, when A is generic and it's not plus or minus one, can I think of it as a non-commutative deformation of this commutative setup? And the answer is yes. So I'm going to come over here. So here's the theorem. Um, due to Turayev, and his slogan is not quantize 
Oops. Okay, so um, what do you, how does it go? If you take A being some generic number, um, is a quantization, and by quantization you should just replace that by non-commutative deformation of S plus or minus one of sigma, right? When you have A equals minus one, everything is commutative, right? You change the gain relation just a little bit, right? You place, replace those minus ones that I just erased by A inverse and A, right? So just make it slightly, um, just push it off a little bit, and you get something non-commutative, okay? So another way of thinking about this is this is um, exactly, right? Remember this is exactly the same as the regular functions on this gain algebra, okay? Um, and not only that, there's um, a Poisson structure in here, right? And this respects Poisson structure. Okay. And I was going to talk about how this it works, um, but I don't have time. And so because I don't have time, I'm going to skip a little bit. You can ask me in, in a little second about this. Um, Oftentimes, remember the Teichmuller space sits inside this SL2C character variety? So oftentimes people will say that the Skane algebra is a quantization of the SL2C character variety, or even better, it's a quantization of Teichmuller space. Okay, so if you take Teichmuller space, make it slightly better, bigger, jiggle it so that it's not commutative anymore, the regular functions aren't commutative anymore, then you get the skein, skein algebra on the surface, which is a little bit kind of crazy, I think. All right, so um, here's another way of thinking about this. Uh, let me over, do it over here. Um, I can think of this, these two as that. Um, another way I can do this is I can um, think of, um, here's a point, there's a map, I can flip it. I could put map here and point here. Everyone okay with me? Um, and so in the quantization, if I want a point in the quantization, Another way of thinking about this as, is as a um, so as a map on this side. Here it's a map to C. I think of C as a vector space with one dimension. If I replace that by um, endomorphisms of um, C to the N instead as a representation on this side. So if you another way of thinking about it is that points in the quantization correspond to representations of the skein algebra. Okay, so here I'm gonna end with one. Ah, shoot. There's no way I'm gonna get that, okay. okay here we go. So here's a the theorem. Um, and this is again a group effort. Um, Francis Bonahan and I, uh, Froman, Tanya Bar, Twisinska, Nya, and Tong Lei, um, Froman, um, and Kanya Bar, Twisinskaya again. Okay, so if I set A to be a um, to be a complex number, and in, pr in particular a primitive nth root of unity, then what happens is that there exists a Zariski dense open subset of the character variety um, U so that for every character in point in U, there exists a unique representation. Which is irreducible. And furthermore, this n is all the same. G 
equals one, p equals one. This isn't quite uh, um, and then else. Um, what I find interesting about this is um, essentially how I think about it, and I know this isn't quite the right picture, but here's the character variety, okay? Sitting inside is Teichmuller space, okay? I take this, I jiggle around, and I define this thing called the quantization. The qu thing in the quantization turns out to consist of, so here I have our representations of the skein algebra. So this is a quantization. And it says for almost all the points in the SL2C character variety, there's, it corresponds to a unique representation of the skein algebra. Okay, and so what I find exciting about this is that um, if I, that this has hyperbolic geometry hidden in there. Right? And so there are some of these representations of the skein algebra which have hyperbolic geometry associated with it in a strong way. Okay? All right. So um, I have um, zero minutes left, which means that I'm going to take one more minute just to tell you <laughs> <laughs> about some interesting questions that I have, which was my part three, which is now gone. So um, the proof of this relies on all sorts of algebraic facts about the skein algebra. So in particular, the skein algebra has um, no zero divisors. It's Noetherian. The center is known, and not only that, the center is related to Chebyshev polynomials. Um, it's finitely generated over its center. Um, it's unknown the dimension of how, how of, of, uh, of over the center. Um, and what I wanted to get at is that if we can understand the algebraic structure of the skein algebra or even skein modules, you, it may be that we can extract hyperbolic meaning from them, right? But kind of all the computations aren't quite all there yet. Um, and um, there's a lot of interesting things, generalizations of this skein module and skein algebra. There's one for the Humphrey polynomial, which is apparently, according to um, uh, Lenny Ng and Tobias Ekholm, related to not contact homology which is again a little bit surprising because that seems like it's like nowhere at all related to this. Um, all of this should have relationships also with quantum algebras, especially representations of UQSL2 because that was where the Jones polynomial and the witten reshetik and Triev stuff came from. So this should also all be related. Um, there's uh, um, conjectures from physics that say this relates to hyperbolic volume or the A polynomial. So it's like this, I'm, this area is like kind of new, I mean like 40 years old, 20, 30, ah, 30 years old. <laughs> and so it's fairly new and it touches on all sorts of different kinds of math. Um, and there's a lot of question in, is in it, questions in it that are completely combinatorial that are kind of fun to work on. And it's like an easy place to just to get your feet wet. So that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is, I know you guys are a lot of graduate students. If you're at all interested about um, teaching at a small liberal arts college, please let me, I mean, you're free, feel free to come and ask me questions about that. I've um, went to a small liberal arts and I've taught only at small liberal arts. So if you're interested, like, just corner me after the talk. And um, thank you so much for coming. Um, questions? I think this is the this is what we want to head towards, right? So right now it's defined on the surface. You can define it on the manifold with boundary, but then it's not clear how the hyperbolic geometry works, right? Here we have this, you know, on the on the thickened on the thickened surface, right? There's some hyperbolic geometry going on. If I have a manifold underneath, um, I can again have this gain module. I don't have this gain algebra. How does that work with all the hyperbolic geometry? This is kind of where it's headed. Yeah, so you're kind of anticipating where we're going with this. Yeah. Um, part of, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So there's stuff that, I think there's a lot of open questions and a lot of w places to work. Um, there's also, um, if you take a surface, right, um, just a thickened surface again, but if it has punctures or um, 
boundary components. You can also include not just framed links, but framed arcs. And then um, there's also some relationship to like decorated Tykemuller space, um, all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay, so the skein algebra is um, base, it's, it's the endomorphisms of the objects in the Witten, Resha, Tiki, and Tarai of quantum invariant TQFT. Okay, so like the Jones polynomial has a TQFT, this um, skein algebra and the skein modules are the things of that, of that category, of that TQFT. Um, the, the holy grail, I think, is to kind of figure out if there's a hyperbolic geometric TQFT, right? If there, we can kind of find a TQFT with hyperbolic geometry kind of built into it. And I don't know, it seems like, I don't know how to do it, but it's kind of like people ask, well, can you do that? I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you.